Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining this uh, seminar today. Um, the topic presented today is design solutions for the blast protection of structures industry experience from uh, young professionals and is given by um, some people, uh, some associates of uh, DJ Goody and Associate LTD, uh, which is a consultancy firm uh, that does, among other things, also uh, blast engineering. In particular, a young member um, of a, a, a member of the Young Second Committee uh, will give an introduction on the topic. And then we'll have Tom, Aidan, Sarah, and Ellen, who will share their experience um, as uh, part of the consultancy. So I leave the stage to uh, Socrates, and I invite you all uh, to keep your uh, microphone muted. Uh, your, all your questions, uh, please keep it until the end. Socrates will, uh, um, will uh, get them and we'll share them with the, with the speakers. Thank you very much, and I leave the stage to Socrates. Um. So, hello everyone, my name is Socrates, and I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Cambridge, researching the blast response of glazed facades. This presentation aims to provide background information on blast engineering and functions as an introduction to the industry experiences presented afterwards by young professionals working for a blast consultancy. The characteristics of a blast load impacting a structure depends on the explosion source, the resulting blast waves, and the interaction of the blast waves with, with the structure. Starting with the explosion sources, these can be categorized into physical, nuclear, or chemical events. Chemical explosions from terrorist attacks that result from the detonation of high explosives constitute a risk to the built environment. These explosive materials are usually in solid or liquid state and are therefore termed condensed phase explosions. To assess the relative performance between high explosives, these are benchmarked against the specific energy of TNT. The condensed phase explosions differ from vapor cloud explosions, where these explosives are in gaseous state. Many accidental vapor cloud explosions have been observed in petrochemical facilities from the ignition of fuel layer mixtures that have resulted from unintended hydrocarbon release. The detonation of high explosives results in shock waves that are characterized by high overpressures developed instantaneously, followed by a decay that will eventually result in negative pressures. On the other hand, vapor cloud explosions often result in lower overpressures with a gradual rise time and a longer duration. These are often termed pressure waves. Parameters required to define the shockwave equations can be found empirically from design guides. These typically depend on the explosion weight and the standoff distance. First principles, such as hydrocodes, can also be used to track the detonation process. Finally, it should be noted that the detonation of high explosions will also result in a blast wind that follows the shockwaves. The resulting loads on structures from blast waves depend on the relative location of the structure and the explosive source. Reflection effects from blast waves reaching the ground must also be considered, with different waves resulting for explosion sources located in free air and for explosion sources in contact with the ground. Shock waves Shock wave. will tend to engulf small structures and squash all the faces. The front and rear faces of a building will be subjected to amplified reflected overpressures due to normal reflection of blast waves on the structure. 
the roof and side faces are perpendicular to the shock wave front and experience the free field overpressures, also known as the side on overpressure, as no reflection amplification occurs. On the other hand, the passage of blast wind is similar to natural wind and therefore causes drag pressure to the object that it encounters on its path. The geometrical shape of the structure obstructing the blast wind flow is important, with dry coefficient equal to 1 commonly applied to the front face for flat surfaces. Negative drag face coefficient values are assigned to the side, rear, and top faces as a result of suction. Finally, superposing the effects from shock waves and blast wind, the pressure time history can be defined from the, for the front face of a building. As the blast waves require time to reach the remaining surfaces, there's a delayed response resulting to a different pressure time history for the remaining faces of a building. Following the definition of the blast loading, the structural response to these pulse excitations will be discussed. As with any dynamic loading, the displacement time history can be derived by solving the dynamic equation of motion. Blast loads, however, are short duration pulses with a time duration in the order of milliseconds. This often results in amplification of the material properties due to high strain rate effects. For viscoelastic materials, such as many interlayers of laminated glass panels, high strain rate effects may result in a fundamentally different response compared to quasi-static loading. Damping effects are often conservatively conservatively ignored in these analyses. The same often applies for the negative phase of blast loading. However, research has shown that in many occasions, the negative phase can dominate the response of some materials such as monolithic glass panels. Finally, the large peak pressures often result in the yielding of materials and in very large deflections. These complicate the blast design of structures as material and geometrical nonlinearities need to be included in the analysis. Simplifying the shape for the front phase pressure time history, the displacement time history can be derived analytically by solving the second order differential equation for both the front face and the remaining faces of the building. The dynamic displacement is often divided by the static displacement and this ratio is termed the dynamic amplification factor. As can be seen from these mathematical expressions, the ratio of the pulse duration to the natural period of the structure dictates the response. By plotting a shock spectrum, the influence of this ratio can be observed. Three different pulses have been considered here. A decreasing triangle, similar to the pressure time history experienced by the front face, a symmetrical triangle, similar to the pressure time history experienced by the remaining faces, and a rectangular pulse included here just for comparison. It is observed that for large ratios the response is quasi-static, with work being done when the load is applied. For this regime, the pulse shape is important, with larger dynamic amplification factors observed for the rectangular pulse. Uh, pressure pulses here have all been plotted with the same peak pressure. For small ratios, the response is impulsive, with the structure experiencing a delayed response compared to the pulse application. For intermediate ratios, the response is characterized as dynamic. Properties of an impulsive regime can be better observed by plotting the shock spectrum for pulses with the same impulse as opposed for plotting with the same peak pressure. It is evident from this uh, shock spectrum that in the impulsive regime, the pulse shape is not important, but the impulse magnitude is important, which is the area below the pressure time history diagram. Common analysis methods for assessing the blast response of structures include analytical solutions, finite element analysis, and equivalent single degree of freedom methods. The latter is a simplified approximated system with an equivalent stiffness, mass, and loading representative of the real structure. 
Finally, I have provided a list of references for further reading that I have found useful during my industry experience and my PhD. Training courses are also useful, such as those offered by DGA, which I have attended myself. I will now pass on the screen access to Hayden for the remainder of this seminar that will focus on the industry experiences of young professionals. Thank you very much. Thank you there, Socrates. Um, my name is Hayden. I am um, a part of DJ Gooden Associates. We will be discussing our experiences and the sorts of things that we get involved in um, as a, uh, a security consultant. I'll start by giving a brief background on the company. So DJ Gooden Associates was formed in 1993 by our chairman, David. Um, this was during the Troubles in Ireland, where there was a need to enhance structures to deal with the effects of weapons and blast. Um, we have now grown to be um, multidisciplinary. We have civil engineers, uh, mechanical engineers. We've had ex-servicemen and architects work for us. We currently sit at 15 engineers. We do not just deal with the uh, weapons effects and blast effects. We look at um, hostile vehicle mitigation, which will be covered later, um, as well as other security um, features that a site might want. We also then accredited with various organizations that you see on the screen now. We also offer in-house testing. This is for blast and ballistics of building fabrics such as doors, windows, um, plated armor, um, as well as then looking at doing forced entry um, off-site. We provide training either at your facilities or we will do in-house training. Um, this may be a day or a week. Um, we also do CPD like we are at the moment. Um, this is ultimately to allow um, for people such as yourselves who have potentially limited or no um, knowledge in this field or for um, organisations oh, such as um, uh, counter-terrorist um, advisors who are looking to improve on their existing knowledge within the field. Due to the nature of our work, um, we will be keeping um, project names, etc., cetera, um, confidential. So where relevant, we will name names. If not, we'll just keep it broad. Um, I'll now pass on to my colleague, Tom, who will talk about his experiences in facades. Thank you very much, Aidan. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you all are. Uh, my name's Tom. Um, so I'm a, a graduate engineer at DJ Gooden Associates. Um, so I'm a mechanical engineer by degree. I graduated uh, with a master's in mechanical engineering from Swansea University in 2018 and joined DJ Good & Associates shortly after. Um, so I've nearly spent two years now at DJ Good and in the blast industry. Um, it's been incredibly interesting already. Some of the projects that I've been, been a part of have included transport hubs, private buildings and venues, and even military buildings. So already blast tends to cover an incredible vast array of different structures uh, and different problems to to overcome um, and it's very eye-opening so one of the big challenges i faced personally was again coming from a mechanical background uh, it's a very different approach in terms of euro codes iso standards i have no, came in with no structural experience, um, which is a good advertisement for cross-discipline cross movement. Uh, learning a lot of the structural engineering, a lot of the background, a lot of the procedure and protocol um, was very important early on and again brings its own struggles trying to start off. Uh, but quickly um, started off on cladding and facades, which is what a lot of us graduates who come in to DJ Good and the industry start off with. Uh, and it's a case of simplifying everything down as much as possible. Like Socrates was talking about um, some of the pressure time thing, time curves, we simply take the straight line and that actually increases the impulse and that builds in conservatism to what we're doing. Uh, and then we apply that to a lot of our different methods. So we have, like Socrates talked about, uh, all our dynamics, uh, our single degree of freedom, uh, which again simplifies a lot of the responses that we're seeing. 
can we do this in, in different ways? And when applying it to substructure paneling, which is what I primarily done early on, I was working on underground stations. Uh, and with that, there's a lot of hoarding and cladding back to the um, concrete around. There's not you know, any standing structures to worry about there, but what we worry about with this, with cladding, is the secondary fragmentation. So after the blast event, all the primary debris and fragmentation from the blast event itself, we have to worry about making sure everything else stays attached, stays where it is, there's no falling hazards, and there's no more hazard to life after that. And now it begins looking at the panelling, whether that's taking a, a giant loaded area, just applying the pressure, and then taking that load all the way through all the subframe members back to the anchorage around all the panelling in the subframe. So chasing that load path is very, very important, and that takes you through all kinds of dynamics, um, moments, shear reactions, and it's, it's very, you have to be very astute, you have to be very thorough in chasing that load path. You, you can't miss anything, as in this industry, that safety and security is absolutely vital. Um, some of the experience I have from my degree and have applied through is, is in finite element analysis, so the 3D analysis, is a small image of an example on the on the bottom right, and that is very much taking trying to simplify as much as possible. Uh, but also, when you have complex geometries, you have strange shapes, you have large structures that you can't simplify down. You, you do sometimes have to apply it in finite element method, and that brings along its own challenges. Whether you you're choosing uh, again nonlinear responses, you're Eulerian versus Lagrangian analysis methods. Um, but a lot of this and a lot of class design comes down to how you choose to approach and, and the analysis and method of analysis you do. And it's, it's building conservatism. It's trying to make everything as safe and as factored as possible. Um, and that, again, brings its own interesting pros and cons to it. Uh, some of the other things that I've done personally, I'm, I'm working on a, a music venue right now, and the scale of that compared to what I've previously done is very different. It's much larger. Um, some repeatability can be found within the structure, and you can simplify, you can analyze the worst case area, um, the worst case cladding areas, um, and, and use that to effectively justify the rest of the structure. And one of the other things I've done was looking at a naval base, and as a military base, the robustness required, the resistance required was far, far higher from anything I'd, I'd encountered before. And, and thus you have to, from the ground up, design things that are far stronger or respond in, in ways that allow you to reduce some of the factors that, that you're looking at. Um, but otherwise, uh, BLAST is, is a very eye-opening industry it, it brings a lot of different problems to it and, and the dynamics of looking at things taking time into account your, your impulse uh, leads you to have to work in tangent sometimes um, with static requirements and structural uh, standard structural engineering and making sure all of that ties together especially when you're working with clients who, who don't have as much blast experiences as the company ourselves uh, passing on to Hayden OK, thank you, Tom. Um, so. Again, continuing on a bit about facades and also then looking at cladding on other large public structures such as stadiums. Um, so a brief background for myself. Um, I graduated in 2015 from Anglia Ruskin. Um, I was a junior engineer at DJ Goods in my final year of um, university. I then graduated and continued employment with them. Um, I, I'm currently an incorporated engineer. I graduate, um, I became that in 2019 um, after working for five years looking at facades, um, building fabrics such as assessing door glazing components for um, manufacturers. Um, I have experience in explosive processing licensing where we would offer support to um, manufacturers that process explosive materials. We would make sure that their structures uh, meet the license intent um, so that they can process their materials safely. I've also looked in um, HVM, so looking at 
vehicle-borne threats to um, assets. This will be covered a bit later by my colleague Helen. Um, ultimately, looking at a, a threat type and then mitigation measures um, to withstand this threat. So, um, talking about facades in infrastructure, um, as you can see here, we have some finalised um, architectural pieces for a, a major infrastructure project in London. Um, these involve um, all sorts of materials from metallic cladding panels to um, reinforced concrete. I've also worked with uh, natural stone as well as a, a finishing. Um, in terms of a cladding unit, it's very much like a standard um, structural frame where you have your frame and it supports slabs. You would have columns and beams, etc., that are then anchored to uh, foundations. With cladding systems, it's very much um, scaling this down to local um, designs where from the right hand um, image, top right hand, you can see there are uh, cladding panels um, hidden behind these. You will have an array of framing which support these panels. Um, you would then, as Thomas stated earlier, work out what the loading is either given in the specification or we would undertake the blast loading within the facility um, to work out what the worst case um, pressures would be. From this, you then um, provide enhancements. Um, we typically would work with architectural firms or a structural engineer who don't, as, as said earlier, um, wouldn't really have this experience of the loads. So we would quite often um, provide quite significant enhancements to designs, or it may be that um, we talk to the client and through understanding their risk appetite, we may not provide robust enhancements, but just ways of restraining um, cladding so that it doesn't project and become um, a post event hazard. Um, we also then often have to sort of discuss with the structural engineer um, why we are doing um, what the enhancements are. So quite often or not, you would have typical live loads and dead loads that we would deal with in um, your traditional load paths, so you'd have gravity where it's all pulling um, towards the floor. With blast loads, it quite often or not um, is directional, where typical designs that are dealing with loads in opposite directions, we then have to provide enhancements which may clash with um, typical details that they would want. So there's there's very much we have to weigh up the pros and cons of, um, of what we're doing to meet the, the specification. We offer um, not just um, initial support on providing specifications to identifying what threat types there are, um, as well as um, detailed design. We also then offer um, on-site support. So seeing the project through to the end, making sure that when the contractor is putting this thing together, that when they have clashes with other systems, um, we can provide um, solutions to overcome these problems. One example I had was that we had uh, two cladding systems, one by our client and another one by a, a separate party, um, were meeting in one particular location. Um, on the drawings that we were given, they weren't a problem. We could fit around their system. However, when it came to actually being on site, they measured that actually um, the finished article um, encroached on where we were installing our cladding. So the contract decided to then notch out part of the supporting framing to our um, cladding system. I then had to go back and use basic engineering principles to work out what effect this would have on our framing system and then provide local enhancements. So that's understanding uh, bending moments and compression loads and then providing localized enhancements to then make up the added difference that we'd lost in the contract and notching pieces out. Um, in terms of then um, site support, that's probably where the creativity of engineering comes out. So to start with, when you can work with um, a design from scratch, you can provide all the enhancements that you need. However, when it comes to being on site, um, quite often not, you have to be creative and, and change details um, to suit what's going on or find new solutions such as adding additional bits and pieces or looking at the risk and saying, what is the risk in this particular location? Um, do the changes, uh, are they commensurate to the, the risk and can we mitigate them? In terms of larger structures such as uh, stadiums, um, we may we also then look at um, 
understanding what the threats are. So as you can see with this structure, um, we would be employed to review the risks to a glazed system such as uh, the stadium you have shown. Um, we would then review the risk, whether they are uh, person-borne devices or vehicle-borne devices, um, and how they would then load the structure. So on the screen, you'll see a, a plan view here of a stadium. As a vehicle-borne device, um, we would look to then determine where the vehicle may travel. It may stop at security points that have been uh, provided as part of the, the, the mitigation scheme, or it might be a person-borne device, so they can get a lot closer to the structure. Um, once this device is detonated, um, we would then assess what the loads would be on the structure. Um, you will find then that dependent on what the loads are, whether it's close to the ground or further up from the structure, uh, the required mitigation measures um, may be quite a lot more uh, significant. Um, in terms of then what is going on with the structure, uh, typically glazed units um, without blast enhancements would produce significant fragmentation within a floor plan. We would then review where these zones may be um, and we would pass this information on to the client so they can determine um, what the threat is and, and whether they want to mitigate it or not. It may be that for ground floor um, or closer to the ground floor that they provide more robust framing and glazing units. Further up the structure, um, they may start to not need to provide um, enhancements. It may be that also um, what we have found in some situations are rather than enhancing the glazing, uh, you would typically have a open floor plan, for instance, in an office room. Um, by providing um, dividers and making it so that it's not open plan and that you've got closed off sections around glazing, um, that the glass may protrude into the building. However, um, because it's only being locally collected within the room, it doesn't pose a significant threat to the rest of the structure. So you're also then limiting the overall threat to um, the occupants of the assets. Um, I'll now pass you over to my colleague, Sarah, who will discuss um, the blast testing that we're involved in. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name's Sarah and I've been working for DGA for the last eight years. Um, my background is that I did a Bachelor's of Engineering and um, an MSc at Coventry University. I did them on a part-time basis um, whilst working for um, Pick Everard, a multidisciplinary company. Um, I worked in the Structures Department. I began as a Structural CAD Technician and then uh, graduated, once I'd graduated, became a graduate structural engineer. I got seconded to DGA um, at the back end of 2011 uh, to help out with the blast design for the large glazed facade for the new NATO headquarters in Brussels. Um, at that time, I'd had no previous blast design experience. I'd done one dynamics module at university, like many of us do. Um, and I was coming from a, a predominantly structures background to um, a civils background. So I was changing from structures to civils and static design to dynamic design. Um, I was able to do this with in-house training um, at DGA. Um, and then I enjoyed it so much that uh, I asked for a job and uh, I officially joined <clears throat> in 2012. Since then, I've worked on a wide range of projects all over the world. Um, like most of us, we all typically start with um, facade projects. Um, I've done numerous embassy buildings, um, little, little projects, big projects. I've worked closely um, with a particular door manufacturer, made sure that their blasters or blast doors are designed correctly and I've overseen installation of their doors to my designs around the world. Um, I've also got involved in designing MOD uh, outdoor firing ranges. Um, this, I've done a few. Um, one of them was quite a big project where I got involved in the civils side, looking at the roads and the drainage for access. I got involved in the structural side because we were building 
um, workshops and control rooms. Then we had the specialist elements where you look at the actual range design and the safety. I had to liaise with various um, statutory bodies, had to apply for building regs, planning, sometimes, um, and then my structural background came in to help me there. Um, much like Hayden's already said, then we sort of progress and we, we look at HVM design and explosive licensing. Um, I'm now working with a client that I worked with on one of my first projects um, for a new facade design in the Middle East. So it's nice to work with a repeat client. Um, I finally got chartered with the Institute of Civil Engineers last year. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, blast testing and why we test things. So if we considered a glass facade design, um, we're looking at it in various components. So we'll consider the glazing. We'll look at the glazed pane and how that's going to behave. We're going to look at the retention system of the glazing. Is it silicon? Is it um, got a cover plate? Then we're going to look at the framing. We're going to look at the how the mullions and the transoms. So the mullions are basically the columns that support the window and your transoms are your beams, the horizontals and verticals. And we'd look at that um, using single degree of freedom analysis um, that will give us a deflection and we can understand the ductility, so how far we've gone into the plastic range. Um, and then when we're happy that that's satisfactory, we would look at the connections back to the main structure. So basically we're considering all of that separately, which is nice. It gives us a good level of conservatism, gives us sort of confidence that it's going to work. Uh, we're looking at so safe design, uh, removal. We always remove the material factors um, because we're looking at ultimate limit state, but we'll add safety factors. So um, sort of the last thing we want to fail is the fixings. <clears throat> so we will add um, a safety factor of like 1.5 for that or more if necessary. In reality, the system's going to work as one and you're going to get load reduction throughout through the system. So typically, you can you are going to get more capacity than can be calculated so by testing it it gives us confidence that it's performing or exceeding the performance that we're expecting um so blast testing there are two main ways to do blast testing uh, you can do an arena test where it's in the open air or you can use a shock tube the test standards specifically for glazing um are ISO uh, 16933 for the arena and ISO 16934 for a shock tube. Um, again, these typically <clears throat> deal with the main glazed pane, but ideally we want to test the whole system. There's nothing to stop us instead of putting the, <clears throat> the glazed frame, the glazed um, pane into the test setup, we could put the whole facade like a, a sample of the facade. So if we have a quick look at how we might set up an arena test in the picture here on top of the white sort of support is uh, the explosive charge. It's an open air arena. Um, you've got your samples in the yellow boxes and also the big grey boxes, different sizes, like I say, the pane or the full facade. <clears throat> All the samples are orientated perpendicular to the detonation point to ensure that they all experience reflected pressures. The samples are contained into a structure to ensure that they have no wraparound air pressure. The explosive charge in the middle, we can vary the distance and the makeup um, to ensure that we get the desired peak pressure and the impulse at the test sample. And then in order to record the results, uh, we'll use um, pressure transducers to record the pressure at the face of the sample. And then also a free air transducer, um, sort of the same distance away, as it were, from the sample, from the electric, the charge. Inside the sample boxes, we'll have witness panels. So if the glass does fragment, we know how much and if it was traveling, like at what sort of speeds it was traveling at. And obviously we will video and photograph photo 
take photos rather, sorry, um, just to um, record what's going on. Um, when it comes to glazing, we determine the glazing hazard level in accordance with the test standards. So um, the diagram over to your right shows um, diagrammatically um, the different how the different hazard levels for glazing. So no break, the glazing would just stay as it is and it wouldn't break. Break safe, the glass might break, but it's retained in the frame. And then low hazard, sort of D, it's it's falling in, but it's not traveling at speed. It's, it's sort of just falling into the space behind sort of at one meter. What we're trying to avoid is high hazard, where you've got large shards of glass traveling at speed, at height into a room. That's what we're trying to avoid. So I'm going to show um, a couple of videos. This, uh, the one on the left is from the outside and the one on the right is from the inside. This was three glazed panes. Um, and I'll press play. So as you can see, the window on the right that was closer to the detonation point has suffered more damage than the other two. Um, the clips have come out around the glazing, but it is just about retained. The glazing's obviously broken, but it would have had a PVB interlayer that held it together. So if I show you stop that one and show you the other one this is inside and it's actually the uh, left hand pane as you're looking at the other that's the wrong one here you can see Glazing breaks, but the PVB interlayers are holding it together. The connection of the framing, the glass retention system there has failed, but not to a point of massive catastrophic failure, but that's something that you could look to improve. Um, so I hope that was of interest, and I'm going to hand you over to Helen, my colleague, who's going to talk to you a bit about um, HVM. Good afternoon. Right, my name's Helen Smith. I'm a senior engineer at DJ Good and Associates. Um, I studied for a master's in civil and architectural engineering at the University of Bath, graduating in 2006. Uh, this was a thin sandwich course, so I did two six-month placements at what was then Babti Group and is now Jacobs. So I was in the environmental department and the structures and special structures department. So I did kind of normal structural engineering bits and bobs, uh, Wembley Stadium, roof um, and various environmental projects for rivers. Um, I then discovered DGA through my dad. Um, and did some summer work for them in 2005. Uh, they obviously liked me so much, they offered me a job and gave me a bursary through my final year at university. And I joined them in 2006 as a graduate engineer. Uh, as the other guys have said, we all seem to start in, at facades. It's like a rite of passage. Um, so I did facades. I did some work on Heathrow Terminal 5, uh, various embassies. Um, I then moved through to do blast modelling with the computational fluid dynamics, which I'd done a bit of a, at uni, but not masses. Um, I also trained in ANSYS, so I can do very basic finite element analysis. I haven't really kept that up, and we now have guys that do this like day in, day out. So I have a background in it, but I don't fully do it anymore. Um, I also worked in explosive licensing, as the other guys have, have alluded to. Um, and then in 2010, I did the government two-day course uh, for hostile vehicle mitigation. Um, and then 
have done that for a while and I also now that kind of morphs into what I'm currently working on I do a lot of physical security so that's fences doors um, hatches bar sets gates that sort of thing and then finally as we say I've got chartered in 2019 so hostile vehicle mitigation um, just give you a bit of a bit of a background to it um, we're looking at a very holistic approach to design on our sites um, you're looking with a blast on a cube root scaling so the further away you can get from a from the source of your explosion the lower the load is going to be so if you can imagine a sphere or a, a semicircle or hemisphere uh, radiating out from your point of detonation and as you get further and further away you kind of get less and less load so if you can keep your threat which in this case is going to be a vehicle borne device away this is great if you can get it a long distance away this is absolutely brilliant um, obviously if you're in the middle of london or somewhere you don't have this space you're basically going to have a pavement width at most so you either have to accept the risk or enhance the structure which is which is what hayden and tom were talking about earlier or you have to do a mixture of the two and you enhance the structure to a certain amount um, and then accept the like the residual risk but you need to make sure that your threat is going to stay at that location that it can't get any closer so whatever you do you have to make that a solid thing so that's where hvm comes in and this was was definitely true when i did my training um, in 2010 we were very much looking at this vehicle borne uh, threat uh, more recently we're getting a different threat vector so like the the london bridge attacks the westminster attack kind of three four years ago um, we're actually looking as the at the vehicle as becoming the weapon um, and at attacking people and crowded places so we're now looking at this this slightly different threat vector so you've got a lot more city centers sports stadia coming online and whereas we used to do big kind of headquarters buildings wanting to keep things away and very governmental buildings requiring hvm you're now looking at a lot more across the board in a lot more a lot more locations um, so i just run you through a, a quick design process for a hostile vehicle mitigation project so there would be an initial risk assessment uh, this might be done by us or it might be done by um, in this case it was a, a football stadium uh, it might be brought to their attention by a government agency or the counter-terrorism security advisor from the police um, we would then look at an initial desktop study so looking at kind of google uh, street view and any um, documentation that we can get our hands on uh, to look at the threats to look at places where people congregate in this in this case we would then go for a site meeting and a walk around and this is is really really important so you get to know the area you get to know the stakeholders so that might be the client the council the police any maybe retail people that are there that have got businesses in the area and whilst engineering is a lot about numbers it's also about the soft skills so-called soft skills so the personal skills you know the the kind of interaction with people um kind of letting them know what's going on kind of allaying their fears as to what's happening uh, we would then undertake a vehicle dynamics assessment looking at um, the vehicle threat routes what speeds they can get up to um, where our potential uh, impact points might be we can then design using off the shelf shelf project products uh, there are quite a number of these now because because HVM has been around for 15 20 years I guess um, and there is a catalogue that tells you what speeds they can reach and what vehicles they can resist or you can uh, design bespoke using those equations that you thought you'd never use again from like A-level physics or your SUVAT equations and your equations of motion um, you then look to specify those things and then put them out to tender we will then go on to construction supervision, making sure that the products that we've specified and designed are going in the ground properly. It's vitally important that their foundations are incorrectly, the spacing of them is correct because you don't want vehicles to get around your uh, defences, basically. So uh, I'm allowed to name this one. This is the Scottish Parliament. Um, we won an award for this um, project 
Um, so the we worked very, very closely with the architects because they have a very, very strong design for this building. Very, uh, it's all about leaves and stuff, as you can see from the Google image in the top left. And we needed to feed into this and we needed to make sure that the measures that we were putting in place complemented um, the building and, and the additional bits of building work that were going on at the time. So some of these, the bollards are off the shelf, uh, but the actual planters and the leaf units we designed in-house using those kind of SUVAT style equations and our knowledge of um, the testing of these products. Um, this is one of those sites that's got absolutely masses of space on it. And this site is a bit like a catalogue of HVM and security equipment. So you can see that we've got kind of ditches and berms, which are, well, they're design, protective design that's been around for hundreds of years with like castles and moats and things. And you can use these to stop vehicles. Um, they're great if you've got lots of space. They're relatively cheap. I mean, they have to be designed to the right shape and size, but they will do the job. Obviously, you can't stick them across the road in London, but you know, in a big site, you, you're OK. Um, you've got bollards here, gates. You've also got a lot of physical security measures. So the personal personnel security gates and all of these things need to interact together. So the middle bottom, you've got your HVM measures coming up to your fence. So the reason they've got these funny pencil toppings on is so that people try and stop people climbing on the bollards and getting over um, the fencing. So a lot of the work we do is is looking at like interactions of products. So under the ground with foundations and making sure that you can work together and everything can take the loads because obviously these bollards are taking high impact loads. But also making sure that you're not um, negating other security measures by what you're putting in. And then layered on top of this, you've got a lot of electronic security as well. So CCTV, um, lighting access control. And that all needs to work as well. And you need to make sure that you're not blocking lines of sight um, and bits and pieces. So we're doing a lot of, yeah, interactions and, and bits and pieces on site. Um, and also, which is, is brilliant with DJ, our chairman's always been very big in research, testing, getting very hands on. So I've run witness blast trials, hostile vehicle mitigation trials. I've had a go at firing Uzis, shotguns, whatever. Um, we've got a tensile test machine in the office. So if we want to find out how strong something is, we'll just go and pull it apart. Um, I've also had a go at welding. So, you know, you need those very hands on uh, experiences so that when you're doing your calculations and you're getting these numbers out, whether you, you know that they're the correct numbers or that things are happening as they should be happening. As kind of Sarah said, you often get a, almost a better result than you were expecting um, compared to your numbers. So you, you need to see it to appreciate it. And you, watching videos just doesn't do it. You have to get there in the flesh. So I couldn't give you an HVM without letting you see um, a crash test. Um, so they're very high impact and you, you generally wait like half a day for everything to get set up. Um, but there's a massive rush of adrenaline, adrenaline when you either when you blow things up or when you crash stuff into stuff. Um, and you can see the guys in the background have got their hands over their ears, which amuses me every time. So uh, any questions? I think Socrates is going to be. Very yep. neat. So um, I would like to, to thank all the presenters. Thank you very much for the uh, for your industry experiences. And now we would like to uh, to open the room to the audience. So if you have any questions that you would like us to address, please feel free to uh, to type them, and I will uh, read them out. Perhaps we can start sharing the screen. Don't know how to do that. I'll present here. There we go. All right. So, um, are there any questions? Something you would like any of these speakers to address?
just gobsmacked everyone. That's what it is. <laughs> Let, let's give another few more minutes to see if anyone comes up with any questions. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Andreas Nilsson. I'm, I'm working for Atkins. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for a great presentation. It was very interesting. Um, in particular, it was very interesting to see some of the videos you showed of uh, testing of uh, uh, glass facades and uh, impacts and, and so on. Uh, I don't have a question, but I note that the meeting chat says um, this meeting chat is muted. So I'm wondering whether people are typing in vain to try and, uh, and give you questions. Oh. I can see a comment from you, Anthony, and one from John W just coming through. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Very good lecture. Is there a recording available after for another viewing? Yes, I believe we are um, we are recording the session. Yes, Valentina replied to that. And um, how are we how are we going to distribute this? Is it going to be on the website or through an email chain? Um, I think we will find um, a, a way, and eventually I will email them privately. Uh, if it's not. Uh, possible to put it on the website yet. Uh, so they just uh, can keep in touch with me and send me an email uh, if they want the recording. Thanks. Okay. Great. Uh, we have a question here from Sarah who's asking, what was the hardest thing you all found in changing directions? That is from structures or mechanical into a specialized field for blast engineering? Um, maybe I can answer that. Um, Oh, the hardest thing. I think it's just having the time to understand the new process. Um, everyone at DGA has um, a good grounding and is always available when you've got your questions. So I, I wouldn't say I found it difficult. I would say the hardest thing is when you've been asked to do something and you're like, I just need five minutes to think about it and sometimes obviously time pressures in work and other people are busy but the knowledge is there you just have to take the time to understand the new process and that's that's it really quite simple i think the same engineering principles throughout it's just a different way of looking at it I, I think it's it's sometimes as simple as things as, as terminology in different industries um, and a knowledge of standards and regulations is things that you wouldn't otherwise know based from other industries. Blast, Blast is a very niche specific industry and there's things that no matter the discipline you wouldn't know otherwise and you again like Sarah you find yourself learning on the job and just needing a bit of time to have a moment decipher to see what's going on. All right, I think we have another question here. I think it relates to the uh, videos. It says, in the arena test, there were three windows. The first window suffered a stronger impulse than the other two. Why? The windows that were is, it, was, it was the distance. So if you look at the video again, I'm not sure quite how I would show you that, but um, the tra it travels from the right to the left across the three facades. So while it was perpendicular, one of them was going to be further away. So it's gone from right to left across the three. That's why it suffered the more most damage. We have one more question for the testing. Did you use commercially available explosives or those of HME origin? Uh, I think it's not exactly us that we do it. The test site actually holds and deals with that explosive, but I think it's some sort of liquid explosive that they use. I have used an antho mix before, which is ammonium nitrate fuel oil. Um, I had a test with that. That was like the biggest bang I ever saw. That was 500 kilos. Um, but I think generally they will use some sort of liquid explosives. It will be a commercially available something or other. It won't be a an HME. Then again, another question on the explosion tests. What is the typical cost of the testing? <laughs> More than my wage. <laughs> yeah, more than mine. <laughs> they are, they, I don't know the exact um, 
costs now. Uh, we used to run commercial blast trials where we would set up one uh, explosion and then different manufacturers would come in and kind of rent a cubicle. So you'd get lots of people sharing the cost of one bang, if you like. Uh, people tend to be less inclined to do that to because kind of, you're kind of sharing your, your pro project, your knowledge a bit. Um, so you end up having individual tests. And I don't know, having not run one for myself for a while, but I know the costs are within the tens of thousands, if not more. They're normally done once all of the, the the calculations are done. They're normally the last, OK, are we going to get this over the line? We Is there anything else we've, you know, are we fully confident? Is there anything else that we need to consider? Could we um, value engineer this out a bit? It's they're done at the end just before the project, like the, the construction starts, really. They're not done regularly. You would normally do one per project if you're going to do them. And also, uh, Sarah, to your previous comment, I think there's a follow up question. If the windows were in three different cubicles in the test that you showed? No, it was the same cubicle, but it was just traveling along. So imagine if you had a normal facade, you've got one build, you know, one pane, and then you've got the neighboring pane and the neighboring pane. So it, it shows that the one, the ones closest that are going to get hit first will take more pressure, as we know, than the neighbouring ones. The next question is, have you considered or ever been involved in the chemical effects of blast, such as fire, for instance? Uh, well, shall I answer that one? Um, yeah, go on, <laughs> So, like, as part of, um, <laughs> so, especially in, for instance, the explosive processing um, markets, you will find that they may be things for countermeasures, such as flares or um, things that wouldn't uh, behave um, as like a high order explosive would. So we would look at the effects of gas and how that behaves rather than an explosive clearing a facility. We would look at how the containment effects of a structure are dealt with with fire and also then the fireball effects that may erupt from the doors or windows. So you typically have um, venting behaviours where you'd look at a structure, you would force parts of the structure to fail purposefully. They would then open and enable the gas um, to balance with um, ambient, temp uh, ambient pressure. You also then look at the effects of temperature. So with, when you've got lots of confinement going on, um, it amplifies the pressure you're dealing with rather than a, a blast event where that's dealt with with the chemical reaction in the device. And then once that energy is expended within the device and it's it's causing a shock wave to occur, um, distance then reduces that. So we do look at incendiary and fire, um, but it's for a different application. Then an another similar question uh, for other side effects for BLAST by Andrea. Have you had any need to consider mitigation against ground shock to below ground structures? I have done for explosive processing. I've dealt with ground shock and transmission between buildings and control rooms and things like that. So yes, we do on occasion. It's also a side thing of um, a client may want to determine um, from a charge what effect it has on the building. So then part of the checks we do are you have a ripple effect in the structure. It will cause a cratering. Um, but do you get reflections off of bedrock or different mediums of soil? And then does it take out the foundations? Um, another interesting question by Andreas. You mentioned that you sometimes need to go back to first principles, and some of you refer to university courses. Do you think that university courses were adequate or even good in terms of teaching you the fundamentals of structural dynamics? I did earthquake engineering, wind engineering, continuum mechanics, and some structural dynamics at university. And to be honest, I still get my university nets out. I can still remember certain lectures that I need to use, so I still go back to my university notes, actually alarmingly <laughs> regularly, um, to look up um, things. So yes, but while you're learning them at university, you're going, yeah, I'm never going to use these again. <laughs> and that's the problem. You learn more, yeah, you learn more when you put it into a practical application and 
you understanding why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. I actually failed my dynamics uh, module at university, and yet here I am. I've obviously passed it the second time around, but once once it's a practical application, like you say, you refer back, we still might look at this, but once you can understand it from a practical point of view, for me, that helps. Yeah, and we do talk about it a lot, don't we, in the office. We yeah. sit down and we, we bash it out between us and we, yeah. The biggest surprise, I think, was that we look we typically look at sort of portal frame structures and a building frame and then when you're thrown into the the deep end when you start at work and you just wonder how do i translate this skill to this project i, I never thought i could design a door or cladding and then you just do because it's it's just <laughs> equations and how do you apply the equations so that that the biggest transition i think from university to work was yeah, I that the skills I had to start with. Yeah, can I can I just echo that? Um, having been involved in the place for like twenty two years, I think one thing we need to recognise is <clears throat> the um, generational effect. Uh, it, it is a case that uh, there are people working on that site whose grandfathers, fathers, uh, and Java's sons are actually working. And that, that does actually impact on their behaviour. Mm. Thanks for that. Um, uh, any other thoughts? The, the change in mission of the site, Lena, as well. I think uh, we have to look at some of this through the paradigm of reprocessing gear and coming to an end and what that might mean for the future. Yes, precisely. OK. Lena, Lena, sorry, can I just add in? I, I think those comments are, are really good across the group, and I think um, you're sort of safe to share there's been a comment of that, so that's really good. <coughs> that's a really good discussion, uh, and I quite like the element of uh, that you put forward in terms of that uh, mission change, I suppose the cultural aspects, uh, but the complexity I think is a, is a good one, it is it? probably, I think Self or Belize is a big organisation that believes that analogy for itself. Um, and it's good that we've probably that conversation about it. it's not necessarily the size, it's probably the complexity, and that's probably within their own gift as well as our own gift, uh, as well as our own gift as well to change. So I think as we go through it, and I know you're probably touching it again, Lena, later on, but as we go through it, might be worth us all reflecting on that as we're setting up, um, you know, uh, short or medium. To Are we back? Hello, I think so. Right, I don't know what happened there. Hello. I don't know, but I muted all. So I think well I have the problem. Sorry. Uh, I think, do, do we have time to, to continue? Because there are quite a few questions. Should I carry on or is there any yeah. pressure? Yeah, that's fine. No, yeah, let's, let's go on, yeah. Yeah, so a question by Han is, how do you deal with conflicts of demand or interest, e.g. you need to be open for the public yet mitigate risks? That is a lot of education, actually, and just a lot of talking. And like we're, we're often working in the within a design team. So you've got your architects and your space planners and your structural engineers and your client and police. You've, you've got everyone and everyone just needs to work together. And you kind of have to understand because you're going to have conflicts between the fire people saying, well, we need to let everyone out of the building. And I was trying to say, well, we want to keep all the doors locked so no one can get in. Um, you've constantly got these conflicts in a design. Uh, it's just another one that needs managing, uh, flagging up, putting on risk registers, whatever you want to do with them. But it's all about the communicating of them. Yeah. It's sort of at the end, it's the client's appetite for this. We're all providing um, ultimately um, recommendations and advice. So from a security side, it's you have a potential threat. This is what you need to do to overcome that threat. It's either that a specification drives the need or it's that the client decides I'm going to suck up the risk. And if it happens, I have to deal with the, the fallout of that or it may be from a reputational point of view that they want to provide these recommendations. So it's, you know, everyone's trying to butt heads because they've all got their own agenda 
that they need to fulfill. But ultimately, it's we're giving the client the bigger picture um, because that's what they want from us. Another question by Iman is on is for laminated glass panels. How significant is the role of the interior compared to the glass panels? Also, what role does the stiffness of the interior or the panel play in regard with the performance improvement? <laughs> Not what your PhD's in or something. So this is, this is PhD, but I, it was you, so I, I, the, the question is more to your industry experience. I can reply after that. What do I find in terms of my PhD? <laughs> Helen or me? Uh, I was going to say you because just kind of um, you've been doing a lot of comparison. I have, I have recently. We, so. Um, Yes, basically. How significant is it? It's very significant. It is important. Um, a particular um, project that I was doing last week, um, for example, I'd got a very meaty piece of glass. It was sort of 60, 80 mil thick. Um, it was force protection. It had, had its ballistic um, rating and it was going for a blast test. They'd put polycarbonate in as one of the interlayers um and um that's brilliant for force protection um i had to assess it using a reduced um, probability of failure for the annealed glass and because this brought the um strength of the annealed glass down so much that the polycarbonate was um stronger and then i had really increased in plane forces which affected my um silicon design so it's it's not a simple answerable question it depends on what application you're putting it in for and how you're required to assess it but yes you pvb is significant and good and as is pvb um sorry uh, polycarb it it all just depends on the purpose of what you're trying to provide yeah, and just to, to follow on that, so my, my thesis is on the post-fracture response of laminated glass panels with PVB interlayers. And obviously, if you if you do have the interlayer, it, uh, it functions for two purposes. First, to mitigate the fragmentation and glass-related injuries. So that's very important because the majority of the glass fragments remain attached to the interlayer and do not become a hazard. And additionally, it offers an enhanced capacity. So you may need to replace, obviously, your panel after it has fractured in the case of an explosion, because it won't be intact, but it will have uh, uh, it has provided its purpose by protecting the the interior of a building and provided significant residual capacity that would not be available if it was just a, a monolithic glass layer. Now, a question by Emmanuel is: What is a typical blast overpressure value? There isn't one. <laughs> yeah, very, it's very subjective. I guess as, as an order of magnitude. How big is your bomb? <laughs> if if so, I took, for instance, a backpack um, and I stood about 15 metres away, um, so a backpack, what, uh, 5 to 10 kilos in there, you're looking at about 200 kPa from a 15 metre distance. So in terms of wind loading, you're expecting it to be about 1 kPa uh, to less than that, depending on if you've got exposed site conditions. Um, whereas these are acting over milliseconds, so a thousandth of a second. So it's ultimately, as was described earlier, if you have a standoff, then this value scales down quite significantly. If you were to stick a backpack next to a column, for instance, um, you might breach the column um, rather than load the column as a whole. So there's different behaviours dependent on where the blast is actually located. Yeah. yeah, so obviously, as you said, it depends on what is your specific type of explosive that you have in relation to the TNT conversion, how much of that weight you have, and how far it is away from your structure. Yeah. But I think it was a good idea that you gave a, an approximate value so people know an idea of how severe it is. I think we, we've gone through all the questions, I, unless I've missed any. I've as been any. looking as well. I yeah, don't I've missed any. Nope. All right, so I would just like to thank everyone again. It was very interesting, very nice uh, experiences. I think it was a very uh, multidisciplinary presentation. And um, hopefully... Thank you very much from me as well.
Yeah. And hopefully we'll have, we'll we'll continue this on with the second uh, young members committee. We'll yeah. have similar type of presentations in the future and to show the diverse of uh, structural dynamics and uh, earthquakes and civil engineering. Don't forget to send uh, your email uh, to be added in the email list, uh, just from for you, but uh, to all participants. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.